So welcome to lecture nine. Uh, this is a makeup since a lot of key people missed the class and there were some quarantine issues. So we're going to post this lecture audio with audio up on Blackboard and YouTube. So announcements from that, we're doing review sessions. We did our lab on Thursday, preserving feeds. The first exam is Thursday, October 1. So last time we talked about how the digestive tract influences the fed nutrients of a cow. It very much simplifies the protein, um, simplifies the vitamins. So we have something less than the total amounts of nutrients that we need. So nutrients consumed uh, is what we're interested in with our animals. And that is a function of the amount the animal takes in. So we'll measure that as DMI, dry matter intake and the percentage or concentration of a specific nutrient in that dry matter, in those pounds. So we multiply get those, those two things together and we get the nutrient consumed. That's what we care about at the end of the day. That's what we're striving for. So when we talk about the nutrients, we're talking about meeting the, making sure that we have the right amount of, uh, right nutrients in the right amount. Or to put it another way, we have the concept of a limiting nutrient. Um, the processes such as growth or production will proceed only as far as fast as their most limiting nutrient will allow. And it's usually a relative amount. If I need two grams and I only have one, I'm at 50% of my requirement. If I need 10 pounds and only have um, seven pounds um that is not my limiting nutrient i have 70 percent of what i need to make that so the lowest percent percentage um compared to what i need and this works for all 50 nutrients as we go through the way to probably best illustrate that is using a barrel so this is representation of a barrel and we can fill up this barrel all the way to the top. And we can call that 100%. If we have 100% of the needed nutrient, we're going to fill that barrel up. If we have all the staves here, the vertical pieces on the barrel, at 100%, we're going to be able to fill that barrel up. If I go through and I look at my nutrients um, and I have something less than 100, so this nutrient over here on the left is at 50%, I can only fill the barrel up to 50%, therefore I can only proceed to 50% in my process. The, uh, everything above that line or above that level in the barrel is wasted. This is not useful. This is not useful. This is not useful. These top halves here are not useful from a productive standpoint. They're wasted. I can only proceed as far or as fast as my limiting nutrient. If I get this nutrient up to 75%, and I have another nutrient that's at 60%, say over here, then this becomes the new limiting nutrient. So if this was lysine, that was limiting. Once we add lysine to the diet, add lysine to the small intestine, my next limiting is megacal or energy. So that becomes my next limiting nutrient. So that's the concept of a limiting nutrient. The first thing we're going to talk about really isn't a nutrient per se, but it's something we use quite a lot, and this is called dry matter intake. So I'll abbreviate it a whole lot, DMI. 
and that's everything in the feed when the water is removed. So we call that the dry matter or it's the other five nutrients, the protein, the fat, the carbohydrate, the minerals, the vitamins that are left in the feed. So why do we care about dry matter intake? Well, it really, if we need to know that, because it's kind of the center of our nutrition program. As we talked, we we're concerned about nutrient intake. Half of figuring that out is determining what the dry matter intake for a particular animal or a particular group is. Then knowing the dry matter intake, we can design a ration that takes that all into account. So if we don't know it, we're not taking advantage of the information that we had and your nutritionist is sort of working in the dark. As a general rule, when feeding ruminants, the more that goes into the body, the more productive they can be. They can grow faster, they can lactate more, they can become pregnant faster. All those things work to the advantage. So when we're thinking about dry matter intake, we'd expect our heifers to be 1% to 2% of body weight, depending on how much NDF is in that um, feed, the concentration they're in. Our lactating animals, for an animal this size, will eat rather aggressively, getting up to as high as 4% dry matter, 4% of body weight. So for every 4 pounds of, uh, or 100 pounds of body weight, they're going to eat 4 pounds of feed. So with 1,600 pound Holstein, you can expect is going to eat, what's 16 times 4, 64 pounds of dry matter at 4% of body weight. So when we think about dry matter intake, it sets the size or the nutrient package that we have to fit all our 50 nutrients in. So if she's eating 40 pounds, that becomes a different diet than if she's eating 60 pounds of dry matter intake. We can think about it as small squares in a wagon. Those of you who have bailed small squares, you can get more in the wagon if you're neat and orderly. Um, you work at it um, to get those extra nutrients in those small spaces requires more work. If we've got big, huge wagons and we don't have people to stack as those bales come out they get kicked into that wagon there's a loose pack in there a lot more airspace um, we can fit less nutrients in there we can fit less um, bales on that wagon we can also look at it as groceries in a shopping cart if we want to get a lot of nutrients in a specific amount of space we're going to have to be more organized about it, more neat about it. That takes time and effort, possibly money. We just toss things in. It's not going to be as tightly packed, and we may not get the same amount of nutrients in there. So let's look at it this way. So we need a certain pound of nutrients. If we take a 16% diet fed to those animals, which is fairly typical for a mid-lactation lactating Holstein. If she's getting 45 pounds, 50 pounds, or 55 pounds, she's consuming 7.28 or 8.8 .8 pounds of crude protein. That amount of crude protein will support 75, 85, or 90 Five pounds of milk. So if we get five more pounds of milk in, we or dry matter intake in, we get ten more pounds of milk. So we're getting. It's also be, the diet becomes or the feeding becomes more efficient. We're getting more milk per pound of feed. If we think about it the other way, if you've got eight point two pounds needed, and they're eating uh, forty five fifty or fifty five pounds. We'll need eight, uh, greater than 18% crude protein, protein diet, 16.4 or 14.9. The 18% uh, crude protein diet is going to be more um, expensive to put together. 
it's going to cost us more, have more costly ingredients than we would with the 14% crude protein. So we track dry matter intake up at the dairy. These are the lactating and dry cow pens. Knowing what uh, the information is for our groups, we can get um, some information that's going to help our nutritionist as she designs the rations. So we calculate our dry matter intake um, and then using that information, um, we can design better rations. So there's a number of factors affecting dry matter intake. We'll go through these one by one. So you need to know um, what increases dry matter intake and what decreases dry matter intake. So when we're talking about body size, the bigger the animal, the more she will consume as a general rule. Production, the more milk she produces, the faster she is growing, the more aggressively, the more she will eat. If she's not producing as much, we're going to eat less. So water availability, the more water we have clean and fresh, the more dry matter will be consumed. The ration itself, if we've got a good balanced ration that's balanced in all 50 nutrients, we're going to have higher consumption of that diet, a greater dry matter intake associated with that diet. If the diet is unbalanced in some way, we've got too much or too little of any given nutrients, we're going to lose dry matter intake. The animal's not going to feel as good, it's not going to be as productive, therefore it's going to be off on its um, intake. Forage quality, it depends on what we're talking about. Are we talking about how uh, the, the stuff tastes, the touch of it, the feel of it, all the things we did for our hay grading, um, hay quality evaluation, all those sensory appraisals. The better it is for those appraisals, generally the more will be consumed. We can talk about forage quality, digestibility sense, so specifically NDF digestibility. As forage quality goes up, NDF digestibility goes up, so does dry matter intake. As forage quality goes down, we're going to lose digestibility and we're going to decrease our dry matter intake because it stays in the rumen longer. Um, it ferments slower, backs up the rumen, so we have less consumed, less fed. Feed access and availability. So does the animal have access to feed when she wants it? If she's not locked off, if she's not in the milking parlor, every time she goes looking for feed, feed is there, she will eat more. If we deny the animal access, if we make the food unavailable, chances are she will eat less across a day. Feeding management. If we do a good job of pushing up feed, mixing our feeds right, uh, making sure that we don't um, uh, put moldy or rotten feed in the mix, better meat feeding management is usually going to lead to higher dramatic intake if we make mistakes in mixing picking our feeds in um delivery of that feed in some way shape or form mixing delivery if we screw those things up we're going to have less dry matter intake so feeding frequency as a general rule the more we feed often we feed the more we're going to have um, consumption. There's a law of diminishing returns on that. Uh, it depends on how big our loads are and how many uh, mixer wagons or mixer trucks we need to feed a group. Um, but generally, the more we feed, the more they eat. Um, it's not the strongest relationship there is. Also, feeding times we need to consider. Cows are corpuscular. 
which means they like to eat at dawn and dusk. So if we feed around those times, they might eat a little bit more. Also, when they come back from milking, there's a desire to eat there. If we make sure we have feed available when they come back from milking, we generally get higher dry matter intakes. Feeding sequence. We generally want to feed our forages before our um, grains our energy before our protein. If we use that sequence, if we're feeding feeds separately, the um, we will get a more stable rumen. A more stable rumen leads to more intake. If we feed our grains before our forages, our uh, proteins before our uh, energy, we're going to upset the rumen in some way, shape, or form. If we do those things, um, we're going to lower intake. Okay, where was I? Um, ration changes. So, our ration changes. If we are consistent in our ration changes, we do them in uh, organized and metered steps as they move from one ration to another, we have better intake. If we do abrupt changes, if we don't keep track of our dry matters and things bounce around too much, we have severe and abrupt changes in our rations. We're going to run into issues in the rumen um, issues with the cow, and we're going to drop uh, dry matter intake. Feed bunk management, if we keep that feed bunk clean, um, clean it out regularly, uh, make sure there's no mold, rotten stuff in there, uh, making sure it's in good repair, all those things are going to, if we manage our bunk right, we're going to promote dry matter intake, if we leave rotten stuff in there, um, don't clean it out on a regular basis, if we don't keep it in good repair, we're going to lose um, feed bunk dry matter intake. Ration moisture content. There's a general uh, thought among nutritionists that the mid-range of moistures, that 40 to 60% moisture, is optimum for intake. If you're outside that range, the general thinking is that you're going to lose dry matter intake. Now, I'm not sure how this squares with pasture. Lush pasture is um, 10 to 20 percent dry matter. Um, one would wonder why that um, is a problem, but generally uh, nutritionists say if it gets too wet, they don't eat it. So, Optimum moisture, that mid-range, 50% plus or minus, maximum intake. If we're outside that, we usually run into problems. If their environment is good, if they've got good beds, they got clean floors, good traction, good ventilation, not too hot, not too cold, a good environment is going to promote dry matter intake. If they're in a poor environment, they're generally not going to eat as much and therefore not be as productive. Social interactions will influence dry matter intake. If you're low in the pecking order, generally you're going to be kept away from feed or you're going to get eat last. So that can, provides the opportunity of less dry matter intake. Also, if you've got an overly dominant animal that tends to defend the feed bunk and takes up an inordinate amount of space and spends too much time doing it, generally that dominant animal will lose feed or lose dry matter intake as well. So depending on where you are, um, how overcrowded things are, um, it may or may not influence dry matter intake. Any negative interactions are going to decrease um, dry matter intake. Health, uh, not eating, not feeling good. Uh, those are uh, poor health, it decreases dry matter intake, 
if an animal is healthy um, and usually hungry and therefore eats more. So factors affecting dry matter intake. Which ones on these lists have the most influence? We had a discussion in class. Um, I'll hit some of the highlights here. If you're thinking about body size and uh, body uh, milk production, those are the determinants that the NRC, National Research Council on Dairy Cattle, uses to determine um, their intake. So those are the big factors there. Um, these things can certainly influence um, on a day-to-day -day basis, so week-to-week -week basis, how we put rations together can influence how much she will eat, how we deliver them, how we handle those. Water, if you don't have any water, you're not going to get any intake at all. Um, we have already talked what quality and quantity will do. Health certainly can wipe out um, dry matter intake. Uh, poor health, no intake. Environment has a profound effect on um, intake, all other things being equal. Poor environments are going to lead to less intake. So it depends a little bit on your perspective. If you're trying to calculate dry matter intake, this might have the biggest influence, body size, body production. If you're looking at the health on a given day, the environment on a given day, how you handle the feed on a given day, those things may influence um, more in that 24-hour period than body size or or milk production. So ultimately we're looking to maximize our dry matter intake, um, looking for um, things moving forward. So if we're going to maximize dry matter intake, these are the things I think you need to do. So always provide fresh feed in front of the animals and it needs to be accessible to the animals. We can say fresh and clean as well. Um, no rotten, no weeds, all that high quality stuff that we talked about relative to hay production. We want high quality and quantity of water. We don't want to limit the animal in any way. We don't want too many solids. Um, we run into issues um, with sulfur water. If the animals are not used to it, they will not drink it. Um, I ran into that problem. We went from my uh, farm which was on limestone bedrock to the uh, fairgrounds and there was a lot of sulfur in the water and our animals just would not drink for the first few days and sometimes we had to carry or bring water up to get them to drink um, to get them ready for the ring we need to balance mix and deliver rations properly so and we need to do that consistently day in day out that feeds down here consistency and gradual changes in our diets. We want to make sure we have a high quality, high digestible, fermentable ration that balances the room and doesn't overdo it. We want healthy cows in a good environment and we want to keep the cows chewing and ruminating. We want to be continually processing that feed as we go through, um, breaking it down, exposing fresh stuff, um, moving it through the system as fast as we can. So to create it, so to create a chart like we did before, we need to monitor our dry matter intake. So we need to have scales on our equipment and make sure they're worked, make sure they're calibrated. If that's something you're interested, we talk more about that in 200. You need to know what was fed to the animals and you need to know what was refused by the animals. We assume the difference between those two, what you put out and what's still there. We assume the rest is consumed. That's a fairly good assumption, but not a perfect assumption. We need to do our moisture tests, our dry matter on our feeds to make sure we know what we're feeding to the animals. If we're going to monitor dry matter intake, we need to know how many animals we're feeding in a group. Once we've collected all that information, we need to calculate our dry matter intake, and then it's much more robust if we um, graph that information. If we look a list of numbers, that is not nearly as informative as when we graph things out. If you go back and look at that slide, that information, we can see trends, we can see bad days, 
fairly easily as we move through. So that's lecture nine. That should get you caught up for those of you that missed it.